stories, spirituality, pathways, and aliens. You're here on The Long Road Home. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to The Long Road Home. What's going on, everybody? How you doing? We're cold. We're froze, y'all. It's snowing. It's been snowing here. Day All, two. Yeah, past two days, it's been snowing. It's supposed to snow like a foot by Saturday. Whew. Absolutely ridiculous. Just got to switch gears. You know, we love the snow. We're all about skiing and getting out in the winter. But I don't know about you, Chad. I just have to like shift gears. <laughs> I don't know. I got thick skin. I, <laughs> I have to shift gears into the summer. Gotcha. I, I just sweat like a pig. I got to like get my winter skin back on. I have winter skin all year. <laughs> this is true. That's why I sweat so much. <laughs> well, guys, today we are finishing up part three of the murder of Nancy Morgan. That's right. And, you know, we've we've covered a lot so far. There's still a lot more to go. There's a whole lot um, more. So we're going to really be getting into the thick of the investigation and the uh, ensuing trial after this. Yeah. Or today. Oh, sorry. But. <laughs> words are hard <laughs> so buckle up folks this is going to be one heck of a ride and you're going to be slamming your head against the wall by the end of it because honestly what happens next is ridiculous <laughs> it's it gets a little wild y'all buckle up <clears throat> but there's a lot to cover so we're really just going to dive in today in this episode we will be concluding the story of nancy's murder the best that we can to pick up where we left off in part two, efforts to solve the murder begin to slow and leads ran dry inside and outside of the county. By March of 1971, the FBI was essentially uninvolved with the case, and North Carolina SBI began to take resources away as well. The case lay dormant until 1984, when notorious Madison County Sheriff E.Y. Ponder made it part of his mission to solve the case to strengthen his reelection campaign. Now, we cannot go any further in our story without first speaking to the history of the Ponders, specifically Zeno and EY. Yes, that's their names. Yep. Zeno and EY. Do we know what EY stands yeah, for? Yeah, we do. It's uh it's something <laughs> something <laughs> some, pretty weird. Hold something on. unfortunate. It is Oh yeah, I have a <laughs> Alamus Yates Ponder. I think that's how you say it. Honestly, I don't know. Elemus? Elemus? It could be Elemus. Elemus Yates? And e Zeno. Elimus? Yeah, so that let's was, just dispel yeah. that for y'all. That's E L Y M A S Yates Ponder E Y Ponder and Zeno. Is Zeno mm -hmm. short for something? Nope. No. Zenoculus. <laughs> I don't. I don't think. I really don't think it is. Okay. Well, we're gonna take a little uh, a little sidebar. Or we're gonna take a little side road and talk about the Ponders for a second. Yeah, they were a political machine in Madison County back in the day. That's right. We also need to note that the two political parties in the United States were not necessarily how they are viewed normally in Madison County. Instead, political beliefs trace back to the Civil War. Strangely, Democrats dedicated themselves to the Confederacy and Republicans remained loyal to the Union. And you know, someone mentioned this to me the other day that this was prior to the flip in the political parties. So it does make more sense to me having remembered that now. Yeah, they, they did flip. Mm-hmm. Big old switcheroo. Yep, same people, different name. <laughs> um, the ties of these two parties, of the two sides of the Civil War, would remain, and in some ways still do remain today. Republicans were able to hold the county until, until the 30s, but after World War II, a local man named Zeno Ponder would arrive back in his home prepared to work to make change in his community. Zeno was born in 1920 and was the youngest of 13 children. That's a lot of kids. Ooh, talk about a litter. It's farm hands. Yeah. You literally you just needed help, so you just kept having a baby. You had to have kids back then. Or you D starved. <laughs> During the war, Zeno, a soil chemist, had spent the war years as a deferred civilian and separated uranium for the Manhattan Project at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Yeah, that to me is crazy because I would have never expected that from someone... I don't know. From Madison don't. County? Yeah, like it's just, it's very interesting to me that that's what he did. Not something I ever thought like any of these people were doing back then. He claims instinctively he knew he was no conservative. Speaking to an interviewer with the University of North Carolina's Southern Oral History Project, he stated, quote, We were liberal, and the Democratic Party was liberal in its views, nationally, state, and country. So we were for that form of government, which would give us a better opportunity to involve ourselves and enjoy some of the goods, some of the good things in life, unquote. Yeah, so he came back to the county with an idea that he wanted to help the county prosper. He, he had some really good ideas initially. Initially. Yeah. 
Zeno knew that the state was essentially owned by the Republicans, and in order to receive financial aid, it was a good idea to be in lockstep with their ideologies. Nonetheless, Zeno stuck with the Democratic Party. He split his time between farming and teaching classes in agriculture. He split his time between farming and teaching classes in agriculture to re- What? Oh, teaching classes in agriculture to returning vets. Sorry. He split his time between farming and teaching classes in agriculture to returning vets, mixing in his New Deal ideologies with his lessons. His interactions with the community in this way gave him the political strength he needed to earn his first elected position, election registrar, in 1948. Yeah, I think really that was his goal when he got back. Is like he knew that was the only way he was going to be able to make a change was to get rid of not only we'll find out the Republicans that held control of the county, but also some of the old Democrats that maybe didn't have the same viewpoints as he did. Gotcha. So he came back, wanted to make his make a change, embedded himself in the community, and started to make small changes enough to get him in some form of government. Yeah, he started to get his foot in the door here. By 1950, Zeno and his older brother EY, who had long been the Democratic standard bearer for the county, were preparing a, according to Pinsky, quote, Democratic insurgency. EY made the decision to run for sheriff that year up against Republican incumbent Hubert Davis. Oh, Hube. <laughs> Hubie. On election day, Zeno wandered in his precinct in Marshall with a 38 on his hip. This district carried EY by two points, and ultimately EY won the county. This is abs- what happens next is s- ridiculous. Absolutely something out of a movie. You could really take a bunch of these different scenes from this story and make a movie on its own. <laughs> I think it would hold a lot. Yeah, like a wacky, zany action comedy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those. Next part is like, imagine what happens next, but with like the Benny Hill theme playing over top of it. That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. So... The Republicans, however, would not cede power. They cited fraud, and instead, um, they holed up in the jail. Heavily armed, they actually laid a 50 caliber machine gun on a tripod outside of the door. EY supporters (laughs) would often drive by... (laughs) Sorry, this is so funny. It's just like they're just playing pranks on each other. It's like they're it's like actual almost children, deadly pranks. Though. Actual children running the government. So EY wins. The Republican said, no, you don't. This is fraudulent. So then they set up a freaking machine gun yeah. outside of their door. And then EY supporters would often drive by throwing corn cobs wrapped in red duct tape to look like dynamite at the jail. Absolutely ridiculous. Just <laughs> It's <laughs> so crazy. Couldn't do that these days. Well, the Ponders eventually took their case to Raleigh and the state Supreme Court. The court sided with the Ponders, who returned to Madison County and stripped the ex-policemen of their weapons. Yep, they came in. They ripped off all the pistols off the Republicans and told them, get out. You can get out. You can get out. This is our <laughs> town now. And uh, it was. It absolutely was. This was only the beginning of the Ponders' power moves in the county. They immediately began removing old guard Democrats and electing those who would help the Ponders consolidate power in the county. In 1954, the Democratic Party won a full ticket of county positions. Teachers paid kickbacks and were told to pad their student enrollments so state funds would allow the hiring of more teachers. Yeah, so they start to get sneaky but almost in like a Robin Hood kind of way there for a while, which I really enjoyed reading about. They start doing this because they know that with more children comes more funding from the state. And so they're just flat out like, just make them up. Johnny Smith. Yeah, just that's just, just uh, make them up. Bobby make them up. Brown. Yeah, a little, <laughs> a little more creative, please. You can do it. These teachers are like, oh, uh, Azalea Smith. E-Y. <laughs> yeah, call on E-Y. I like that name. But yeah, so with more funding, also eventually uh, came more roads. And more infrastructure in the county. So they so, knew what they were doing. Sneaky snakes, but for the betterment of the community. Yeah. Ah, it's, it's a gray it's area. Like, <laughs> yeah, a gray area. We'll, we'll call it that. We'll call it that. Well, Pinsky claims that extracting roads from Raleigh became Zeno's claim to fame to such a degree that it actually entered the realm of legend. What is, okay, I lived there for 20 years, pretty much full time. And I never heard about Zeno's roads. Okay, uh, I just Googled EY Ponder. 
And Ponder Machine is the first thing that came up, and it's talking about Madison County. So I think that's really what it means is that he, they were a legend in that way. No, they are. I mean, even today, like people that I like older folk that I know talk about the Ponders in that way. Uh, some of them loved them. Some of them really hated them. It was uh, very divisive. Very much so. The county's known for that, though. Uh, it's true. Yeah. I mean, really and truly, <laughs> it's even really today black it or is. white. <laughs> it is. There's not a lot of in between in Madison County. You could say that in the early days, the Ponders really focused on getting things to the county that people needed, be it food, shoes, housing support, you name it. Yeah, they did. They were trying really hard to not only help people, but also create a base of constituents, I think. Well, that's very true. Mm -hmm. um, well, at one point after the 1954 election, Zeno, EY, and eight other family members were indicted by the Eisenhower Justice Department for voter fraud. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, this happened a lot, we'll find out later on, but it doesn't seem like anything ever came of any of the charges. Well, yeah, a federal jury in Asheville leaning heavily Democratic quickly acquitted all 10. Claims of fraud continued, however. Joe Huff, an attorney who will become very important in a bit, claims that locals would go into polling stations and officials there would let them fill in ballots for other people. <laughs> yeah, they'd just be like, uh, you want Tim's? You want Tim's too? Here. So they were at this point, they were used to padding things, right? <laughs> they were padding heavy in the in the polling booths. I don't know what happens when Tim shows up, though, and his fucking ballot's gone. <laughs> what do you do? You oh, right. You give Tim Leslie's. Well, you know, are they real people? I guess they would have to be real people. I mean, they had to they be I can't make them up like they were doing it for the... I don't know. People have used dead people to fill in, to pad voting polls as well. So, I don't know. I don't know. Well, Clyde Parks, a Republican and military retiree, stated, quote, I couldn't even get a job in Madison County. I don't like socialism, but I don't like dictatorships either. And I honestly, to God, believe that's what we've had in Madison County since the Ponder family took over. So like we said earlier, you're either, you either love them or you hate them. This point was not just a Republican sentiment after a while. Joe Huff, a lifelong rival of the Ponders, again had this to say, quote, It was the worst damn dictatorship you'd ever seen. If you weren't one of the faithful, you didn't get a job, end quote. Yeah, that's crazy. They could, they could determine whether or not you could find employment in the county. It didn't matter who you necessarily politically aligned with. It was whether or not you were on their side. Um, and they, a lot of Democrats ended up really resenting them for this exact type of thing. So something that I found kind of also, everything here is like so strange to me. The whole thing is just odd. Like it's just an odd mishmash of stuff, right? So something that they were kind of noted for in the 60s were actually their support of civil rights. Uh, once segregation had ended, EY made sure that the schools followed it immediately. Uh, Eli believed that busing uh, African-American students to and from school in Asheville where they had to go was morally wrong. He also called it financially wrong because he always had numbers in his head, I guess, uh, in terms of just like things. And he, he was always thinking of money for the county as well. Um, well, Asheville's far away. Oh, you know, it's like a 45 minute drive, especially. Like, and, you know, I don't know where they live. They might have lived in Laurel and then it's like an hour and a half away. It's, it, what was happening there was stupid. EY made sure that as soon as segregation was over, he made it happen in Madison County. Um, he also says that he would have raised hell if he was a slave i don't fucking know i you know ey will you know i don't know this Talk is fucking about a weird speaking topic. from a point of privilege EY. yeah right jeez if i would have been uh so but yeah so ey was what you would call a progressive in madison county a local progressive anyway right zeno also supported the civil rights movement but also often boasted of his anglo-saxon blood so Oof. yeah um it's a weird like i said Weird mishmash of beliefs that these two brothers had, right? I don't know. We might just cut all that. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know. It's fucking a weird topic. Regardless, though, they were semi-progressive for the time. Now, in 1970. But also simultaneously holding the position of dictatorship over the county. Yeah, and also kind of racist. Great. Yeah. Okay. Weird dude. Moving on. Um. So in 1970, after Roy Roberts decided to end his term as sheriff during the Nancy Morgan investigation... EY once again made a return to politics. By 1982, he had been elected sheriff of Madison County twice. He made solving Nancy's murder part of his platform, but the year was now 1984, and no investigative work had really begun. During this time period, things had begun to change in the county. The Ponder brothers were aging, and it seemed 
like the next generation of Ponders, did not show the same interest and power in the county as Zeno and EY. In general, it felt as if support was appearing to erode for the Ponders in the county, and a more experienced Diedrich Brown, who we've mentioned several times throughout the series, was prepared to jump on this opportunity and make a run for the position of sheriff. People in the county were beginning to believe that a new sheriff or a new faction within the Democratic Party would pursue this more successfully than had been done in the past. Their grip on the county was slipping, but the Ponders would soon catch a break. So, like we said, it's 1984. Nothing's been done, right? So, a man named Johnny Waldrop stepped forward while serving time in Madison County Jail with his own version of what happened to Nancy. Johnny was actually Ed Walker's neighbor in Bluff and was the man that woke him up the next day after Nancy had went missing. Generally, he was also hated in the county as well. He was known as like the village idiot, town drunk. He was kind of a fuck up. Again, he, he, not kind of. He was a fuck up. Again, off to a good start. So. Yeah, um, a man of dimwit and not much else. Johnny was currently doing time for the assault of Tom Maloney and the theft of a car he used to leave the state shortly after. Now, Tom Maloney is a friend of mine. Uh, he's my we friend's father, Tom. and we we've spent a lot of time with Tom. He's a really great person, and what happened to him is really crazy. So Tom was an Air Force retiree and moved to Madison County in 1979. He settled in the Bluff community, and Nancy's death piqued his interest because in a previous job in Florida, he actually headed the city of Titusville's social service department where he supervised VISTAs. One of the VISTAs he supervised knew Nancy. So Tom and his wife Barbara had a lot of problems with Waldrop and filed charges several times against him for threatening them. He said that Waldrop was harassing us, continually telling us he was going to burn us out. So this dude fucking crazy, just threatening everyone. This, Tom and Barbara were not the only people he did this type of thing to. But the most serious thing that happened between them took place in 1983. The Malonies ran into Johnny as they went in to buy groceries, and according to Tom, Waldrop stepped in front of him snickering, and Maloney said, get out of my face. Waldrop then reached into a neighbor's parked car, pulled out a 22 rifle, and put it to Maloney's head. Jesus. Yeah, he's fucking psycho. A real piece of shit. So Tom said, I turned around at that point and started to walk back, and I heard a click. There was no bullet in the chamber. Yeah. So So he intended he intended to harm yeah. Tom Maloney that day. Yeah, pretty much. He he's a fucking giant piece of shit. So this time they'd had enough. EY had continued to like press them to drop a lot of their charges, but this time he was like, fuck no. Yeah. Uh good. Yeah, so he did file charges with the sheriff's office. Now, EY, something that we did not mention yet, he was notorious for looking out for local people that supported him or helped him in some sort of way, form or fashion, right? So, Ponder said that he knew Johnny had just lost it for a bit and Waldrop was a good old boy. Doesn't mean fucking anything, but he just wanted them to drop it because he knew that if he needed, like, some dirty work to get done, he could count on Johnny Waldrop to go do it for him so he could stay out of trouble. Right. But Tom refused. Because he, he should. Yeah, he absolutely good. should. <laughs> yeah. So, Waldrop was already in trouble for a uh, church break-in that had earned him a suspended five-year sentence. Somehow, he picked up that Tom had char- had went through with the charges, and knowing another conviction would send him to state prison, he stole his quote-unquote uncle, Howard Finley's truck, and took off for Texas. Awesome. Um, while he was in Texas, Waldrop ran out of money and called Ponder. Johnny proposed that the sheriff send him enough money for gas and travel expenses, and he would drive Finley's truck back to Madison County. E.Y. refused and told him to turn himself in in the truck in the nearest Texas jail. He wanted to let local authorities pay to send Johnny home, and he would arrange to have the truck returned to North Carolina. So yeah, this is how Johnny ended up in jail. This is just how he ended up in jail. Also, not the only time he calls the sheriff for money in the story. No, it's not. <laughs> it's okay. ridiculous. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, y- you're going to rip your hair out, guys. This is what... Honestly, this story shouldn't have happened. It really shouldn't have. It shouldn't. So, but, okay, so there's good old boy. Oh, I hate that term. I know. Good old boy. You hear good Johnny old boy. Waldrup. Just he's a, been in jail for a, a year. Boy. What happens? Yeah. And I'm sorry. He was in jail, not prison. Is that right? Yeah. He. Um. Yeah. So he never went to state prison when he came back. Awesome. Great. So he spent a year in Madison County Jail. No one's entirely certain why he didn't get sent to state prison. But I ponder. <laughs> I mean, that's um, why, right? Allegedly. So Okay, so take us back. He's been in jail. It's been yeah. a year. After a year in jail, Johnny decided that he needed to clear his conscience and offered up a new account of Nancy's murder, one that involved Ed Walker. So, once again, Ed gets thrown back into the spotlight. Walker, now 34 years old, 
had moved back to Florida and lived on the Gulf Coast with his wife and Whoa, daughter. Whoa, I'm sorry. He's what? 34 years old. Yeah. He was only 20. Yeah. He was 20 when that all went down. Mm-hmm. So this is 14 o- years have passed. Yeah, this is over Holy a decade. Holy shit, I didn't realize that he, that he was that young. Yeah, they were just, they were all like college, like they were like, either in between college and high school or they had didn't know what to do and so they, they joined the program. Yeah. I don't know, I always pictured I just always pictured him as like the older, wiser part of the group, but he was twenty no, years old. No, he was hot headed. He was politically radical, and he wanted to make change, and that's why I joined the Vistas, kind of. And he also, at some point, claims it was just a way for him to not end up hitchhiking around the country. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, he was just like a lot of people do, young, and joined one of these service corps to just get experience and go see new places. Holy cow! Okay, yeah. so he's now thirty-four years old and living on the Gulf Coast. Yep, he has a wife and daughter, and he had found a job as an auto parts supervisor at a Dodge dealership and was considered one of their best employees. On August 14th, 1984, there was a knock on Ed's door at 10 p.m. A local deputy, an agent from the North Carolina SBI, and an older man, who Ed would later describe as a kind of bumpkin, were on the other side. (laughs) That bumpkin was E.Y. Ponder. Oh, shit! Yeah, he wouldn't know until later. I didn't put that together. Uh Okay. Uh, as Ed invited them in, the men asked Ed to come with them to the local sheriff's office. His wife was at work at the time, and they allowed him to stay at his house until she returned so she could take care of their daughter. I wonder what she did. Uh, she actually worked for the police department. She was a temp there at the time. Nice, babe. You got that answer right in your back pocket. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I do. <laughs> well done. I've done I've, this story is ingrained you've in my been, brain at this point. I've been, I'm so, honestly, I've... Really enjoyed it, but I'm so glad we get to move on after this because yeah, it is a really frustrating story, and I've just been ripping my hair out for three weeks. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so once at the station, one of the men told him, we have information from a person who has told us who committed this crime. The agents asked him a number of questions before Ed began to realize that some of them were sounding accusatory. He asked what was going on, to which one of the men replied that their witness had told them that Ed was the one who killed Nancy. Ed immediately asked for a ride home. On the way home, He asked the SBI agent, what does this really mean? What are you telling me? To which the agent responded, well, you're in a world of shit. And if you can't afford F. Lee Bailey, you'd better get the best lawyer you can. Now, I don't know who F. Lee Bailey is. This is an obscure reference, but nonetheless, it was menacing. Um, He was actually a criminal defense attorney best known for representing O.J. No shit. Yeah. So, God, what a... What a deep cut. From he was like, he was a well known American <laughs> attorney. Crazy. Okay. Even before the O. J. Simpson trial. Wait, wait, so he represented OJ before he murdered that woman? So no, OJ happened in nineteen ninety five. So this was eighteen or excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> this was nineteen eighty four when this is all happening. So it's eleven years prior to the OJ case. But most of his career he was licensed in Florida. Oh wow, okay, cool. Well, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'm not super impressed, I guess. I don't know lawyers. I mean, shit. he got O.J. Lewis. He could have got. He sure he does have a dead. trading card. Uh, so <laughs> the next day on his wife's birthday, Ed met with his best friend Aww. and explained what had happened. Yeah, this is actually why he remembers the date being August 14th, that they showed up on his door because the next day was his wife's birthday. Gotcha. So he asked his friend what his advice would be, and he told him to seek a lawyer immediately. Ed had never been in trouble with the law before and struggled to find a resource, so he contacted a real estate lawyer he knew who had been a judge in Ohio before moving to Florida. So that's really um, telling. Really telling of he does not understand the world that he's about to be in. Absolutely not. The real estate lawyer told him that Ed should sit tight because no arrest warrant had been made. But five days later, after hearing testimony from Sheriff Ponder, Johnny Waldrop, and agents from the FBI and the SBI, a grand jury indicted Ed Walker for first-degree murder, rape, and obstruction of justice. So 14 years later, a warrant is issued for Ed Walker. Ponder quickly took credit for the indictment, even though many, including the Republican district attorney, believe this would polarize the community and turn the trial into a political fight. This is something that Ponder might have wanted, believing that the Democrats would line up behind the prosecution and the Republicans behind the defense. It wasn't until the next day that Ed would know of the indictment, hearing about it from his old Vista supervisor who had seen it in a Charlotte paper. He was soon back in his lawyer's office, who offered to arrange for a local public defender in Madison County, but Ed was not sure how he could qualify. At this time, he owned two houses, a boat, a car, and had money in his bank account. What the attorney said next would become reality for Ed in the coming weeks. 
The attorney said, you can't afford what you're about to get into. You're looking at twenty five to thirty thousand dollars worth of legal expenses. Holy fuck. Yeah. Life just blown up in yeah, in exploded. An yeah. Fortunately, they were able to make an appointment with a local public defender in Madison County. Pinsky writes that according to Walker, the public defender said he would arrange for Ed to return to North Carolina where he would immediately be released on bail. Prosecutor Tom Rusher had, according to his own recollection, agreed with the Florida attorney that if Walker were to come to North Carolina at his own expense, they would arrange for some kind of bond and he would not be required to be incarcerated. So Ed at this point in his brain was like, I'm going to go up here. I'm going to talk to them. They're going to realize what they've done and I'm just going to come back. We're just going to go take care of it. Yeah. Yeah, He wanted that to be reality, but it wasn't. Ed then made arrangements to fly to Asheville to meet his public defender. He packed three suits took some coupons for discounts at the Holiday Inn where he thought he would be put up, and told his boss he was going to North Carolina for a long weekend. Ed would soon discover, however, that his ideas about what was going to happen were already null and void. Walker arrived at the airport, and as he and the public defender found his bags, he asked him what would happen next. The lawyer replied, Well, they're going to put you in jail. They ain't going to put you up anywhere. They're going to put you in jail, and they're going to keep you there until they try you. Really kind words from his public defender. Yeah. What a fucking piece of shit as well. Just like, oh, well, we all lied. We all yeah. lied. We tricked you into coming here voluntarily and paying your way to come here. Mm-hmm. Um, You're going to jail. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how they can do that. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem right. No. I don't know enough about it, though. I, I don't. don't. I don't know, but it seems like he uh, was lied to by law enforcement. <laughs> right? Right. Like, like by the judicial seem... system. It seems fucked up. Okay. Yeah. He actually brought with him $5,000 in traveler's checks to make bonds so he could leave. And they set his bail at $100,000 oh to find God. out. It, after he was arraigned, it went down to fifty, but he still couldn't afford it with, yeah. his, with the money he brought. So he Where's... was totally fucked. What? That's He doesn't have just fifty k sitting in his back pocket? <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. So, well... So in order to make bond in North Carolina, you had to pay 15% of that number. Right. So he was so close at one point. Oh, right. he still couldn't do it. Yeah. So the lawyer wasn't wrong about what he said to Ed. Walker entered the jail, escorted by deputies, as he waited through a crowd of reporters and photographers. He was read his rights by E.Y. Ponder, his photograph was taken, and he was shown to his quote-unquote room. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Madison County Jail at times appeared to be extremely lax. Ed recalled they didn't make him change his clothes. His luggage was just sent up to his room without being searched. And EY even asked him if he carried a knife, which Ed said no. And EY said, okay. It's crazy. All right. Just every piece Go of the up. story is so strange <laughs> it's, yeah, and over like, the top. What a like surreal experience to enter a jail and they're like, go on up. Just go sit there. Just, yeah, take your stuff and we get like going to, up. We like to think we're pretty fun here. <laughs> you can keep your clothes, man. EY was known for this. He wanted to keep the jail kind of lax, and he there was a rumor that he took some of the weed plants from uh, that were confiscated from downstairs, and very slowly, leaf by leaf, those plants would vanish. Really? Yeah, they were getting high in the jail. So that's why it was just so lax. He's like, just chill <laughs> out, man. Yeah, just relax. Can't man. we all just get along? Just don't bring your knife. <laughs> um, yeah, most of the time the prisoners could walk freely through the jail, which actually led Walker to have an interaction with the son of Leroy Johnson, the Hot Springs Sheriff. He was in jail because uh, he was waiting trial for poisoning his five-year-old daughter to death in an effort to win back his estranged wife. This guy is a fucker, and we're going to talk about him more later. Oh, my um, Lord. Every just, like I said, every piece of this story yeah, could be its own film. Yeah, they were all crazy. They all they all were just doing wacky shit. Again, I just got to gotta state this. Ed Walker met Richard Johnson, who was in jail, yeah. Awaiting trial for poisoning his daughter to get his wife back. They met because they were just allowed to freely wander yeah. the jail. <laughs> they're both just wandering around. Okay, continue. Sorry uh, to interrupt. It's just crazy. <laughs> so after settling, Ponder took him to the courthouse in the county clerk's office, where Walker asked to have an attorney appointed for him. The request was approved, and on this day, Ed Walker had a fate-changing stroke of luck when the Ponder's lifelong opponent, Joe Huff, accepted his new client by telephone. 
So, yeah, this is honestly the luckiest thing, kind of, that could have happened to Ed at this point. Um, like we said earlier, Joe Huff and the Ponders hated one another. They had a rivalry that began in college. Almost immediately, the two rubbed each other the wrong way from the first time they met. Huff claims his people from Mars Hill had fought in the Confederate Army, while people from Ponder's neck of the woods joined robber bands and pillaged while my grandfather and others were out fighting the war. So once again, controversial character. Joe Huff, representing an innocent man, also known for flying a Confederate flag out to re- re- to remember his quote-unquote ancestors. So, you know, whatever. Uh, it's complex. It's a it's, complex area. It's very complex. Yeah, we're not saying it's good. But there's a lot of crossed wires. Yes. Um, the, the mutual hatred between Zeno and Joe had actually led to many altercations, including a fistfight in the courthouse that both claimed they won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also had a fistfight in 1964 in a Mars Hill voting precinct in an argument over ballots. It turned into a fistfight and then a brawl in an elementary school classroom. So what's really crazy here is as they were fighting, they knocked open a closet door and a bunch of stuffed ballot boxes fell out. (laughs) The fucking, everyone was fighting. The closet falls open. The the ballot boxes fall out. Everyone pulls out a bunch of guns. And then before anyone shot, a bunch of deputies come in. They took all the boxes to the sheriff's office, including the stuffed ones. Fucking, what is going on? Just Um, insanity. Zany. So that year, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Benny Hill theme is playing over this whole entire thing. Um, so that year, Zeno won the district known as a stronghold of conservative and anti-Ponder factions. So I don't know what's going on there. quote, unquote, won. Yeah, exactly. Now, Joe and Zeno were actually both Democrats, but they never had anything good to say about each other. Zeno had said that Joe Huff is what we call a revolving son of a bitch. Any way you look at him, he's a son of a bitch. <laughs> That's a really good saying. I really like that. <laughs> anyway, you look at him. Yeah. He's a son of a bitch. That one's, I, I've had that one in my back pocket. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah we got to mm-hmm. keep that one um, at the ready. Yeah. Now, the rivalry between Joe and the Ponders set the stage for what was already a looming political battle in the trial of Ed Walker. Initially, Joe Walker did not see... Nope, Ed Walker. Joe Walker. <laughs> so initially, Walker did not see Joe as an asset. The first time he met him, he was wearing a flannel, blue jeans, and hiking boots. He was like he was an outdoorsman. He really liked being outside. He knew a lot of... Uh, he did a lot of work outside. So he just... You know, he was pretty casual. And at this point, it was later in his career, and he just didn't really feel like fucking putting a suit on every day. Who does? So yeah, the first time you met him, he wasn't super impressed, and we would come to find later that Joe is an extremely competent lawyer. So, Walker thought he might be doomed, but the first time he met Joe, Joe tried hard to make his time in jail as comfortable as he could. He offered to get him books, newspapers, and things like that. Um, Walker had actually seen his indictment by this point and asked Joe if he knew Johnny Waldrop because Ed knew Johnny Waldrop because they were neighbors. He knew right. Johnny was a fuck up. Right. He knew he was an idiot. So, as soon as he realized what was happening, he was like, why am I here? Right. He just like couldn't understand why anyone would yeah. believe him. Exactly. He, he couldn't understand it. So Joe tried his best to help, but Ed's luck just continued to get worse. Labor Day was approaching, and he was not, at the time, he was nervous because he didn't really know Joe, and he wanted to to try and look for a new lawyer. He wasn't going to be able to get in contact for any more legal help because of Labor Day, and like we said earlier, he found out that his bail had been set at $100,000, and he couldn't afford to get out. Um, His $5,000 just wasn't going to be enough, but it was at this time, however, that Tom Maloney stepped into the fight. As we spoke to earlier, Tom had supervised Vistas and had several altercations with Waldrop. Understanding what was happening, Tom, the retired Air Force officer who lived in Bluff, put his property up to serve as bail for Ed. Tom had this to say about this act of kindness. We didn't know Ed, but we knew Johnny, and the fact that Ed was a Vista worker said enough as far as I was concerned. Tom served as a beacon of hope for Ed in the days leading up to the trial, and during the 10 days before he was released on bail, Tom would come by regularly with newspapers and also took messages to Ed's friends who were still in bluff. Once Ed was released, he left immediately and drove back to Florida with his brother. So, Tom fucking rocks. Yeah, he does. The fact that he put his property up for someone he didn't know to me is 
is really, really cool. Well, he knew Johnny. Yeah, exactly. He knew Johnny. <laughs> Everyone knew Johnny. And this is like, once again, it goes back to like, why is this happening? Everyone fucking hated him. Because of the political machine, Chad. Yeah, the Ponder machine was yeah. grinding, it seems like. Uh, and we're going to come to find out maybe that's what was happening a little bit later. Unfortunately, Ed Walker's life took a very serious hit because of the accusations from Johnny Waldrop. He and his wife both lost their jobs and were forced to sell the entirety of their belongings in order to pay for travel to North Carolina and the court fees that were required. Yeah, so this ex- destroyed his life. He was forced to move to a sketchy part of town, and eventually Walker says, quote, We just gave up, stopped paying bills, and didn't make an effort, end quote. The only thing the Walkers had to their name by the day of the trial was $52 and an old Cadillac. Soon after, they moved into a garage apartment at his sister's home. Oof. Yeah, it Rough really go. just I mean, he was so he was doing so well. They were doing they had two homes and the fact and that, like a boat yeah. and were living life. I think it says something about the judicial system that a man who had all of this had to get rid of everything in order to pay for court fees. Right. I mean, and we'll we'll get more into what happens later on, but Yeah. Like no That was a lot of money. No recompense. Yeah. Nothing. The fact that Ed Walker had his entire life ruined by one bumpkin is only exacerbated by the fact that Johnny Waldrop was nowhere to be found when the trial was originally scheduled in April 1985. He just didn't show up. So this the motherfucker, eyewitness. the eyewitness who is responsible for Ed having to sit in jail for how long? A long time. A long time. Several. I mean. Uh, didn't show up for court. Yeah. Didn't show up for the trial. This is this this. This is where the story just gets crazier, which is hard to say. I know we keep saying that, and it's like, you, you guys are probably sick of it by now, and I'll stop. But, ah, Johnny Waldrop called the sheriff's Johnny Waldrop called the sheriff's office from Salt Lake City, where he was stranded. Johnny wasn't the only doofus in this point of the story. He convinced a deputy to wire him bus fare, so he was stranded in Salt Lake City. Convinced a deputy to wire him bus fare so he could make it back for the trial. Yeah. But instead, Johnny used that money to disappear again. Yeah, he just left again. I, I don't know. It's like, hey, hey, deputy. That's the second time I someone's sure just could giving use him money. some money <laughs> to get back home for my trial. Could you send me some money? The next time he called, he was in Los Angeles and asked for even more money. Ponder now was embarrassed by the entire situation and told newspapers that the request for a new trial date was the result of an ill witness while he secretly contacted someone in Southern California to put Johnny back on a bus to North Carolina. And he watched going, Deputy Tim, did you give him money? He's like, oh, no, well, I he did. Just, he just said that I'm he needed sorry. a little bit of help and he was going to come on right back. He told me he was bringing me something from Salt Lake. I never... <laughs> been there oh my god okay so uh in august of 1984 we arrive at the trial over the next several days the people of madison county witnessed a kangaroo court that oversaw a strange and muddled courtroom examination yeah it's weird uh (laughs) i immediately thought like a coen brothers movie (laughs) like kind of like drab and dry but also like super like funny to see happen dude that would be this entire case yeah absolutely. copyright copyright trademark you heard it here don't steal it it's documented don't take it <laughs> it's our movie our movie idea we need some uh some angels throw some money but it's so interesting it's so interesting because this the story the throughout the entirety of this story everything is just handled in a crazy way the story is very wild but i was still surprised when the when the trial went the way that it did. Yeah, it's just like you don't think it's going to get any stranger, and then it just slides. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's get in here. The prosecution was headed by District Attorney Tom Rusher and Joe Huff spearheading the defense. The domed arena-style courthouse and its 160 seats were packed on the first day. More people stood at the back of the courtroom and into the street. Ed's sister, daughter, mother, and aunt were present. Since Nancy's murder, her father had died of stomach cancer. Her younger brother, George, was touring with a rock band, but her mother, brother John, and aunt were in attendance. They sat on the right, directly behind the prosecutors. The room was also full of Ed supporters from Bluff and the rest of Madison County. 
Rusher gave the opening statement, hoping to relate the murder to the likeness of one of the many ballads the jury could relate to. Huff declined to address the jury, saying, quote, We have nothing to prove, Your Honor. End quote. First up for the prosecution was former Sheriff Roy Roberts. Roberts admitted that at the time of the murder, he had not questioned Johnny Waldrop directly. He also said he had interviewed Ed Walker at the scene and that he had not arrested anyone at the time because of insufficient evidence. Next up was the state's key witness, Johnny. According to Pinsky, Johnny said he had met Nancy Morgan at Walker's house the Saturday before Nancy's final Sunday dinner while mowing Walker's lawn. This statement was not reported at the time and has never been corroborated. He claimed that late Sunday night after hearing a noise, he went to Walker's house. He said, quote, I walked around to the side of the house and I looked through the window. And oh, wait. I- Can I do this with my mountain voice? Yes. Okay. Start okay. To say he said, "quote." He said, "quote." I walked around to the side of the house and looked through the window, and I see two people see, in the I'm house. I'm sorry, babe. I have a request. Huh? That doesn't sound bumpkiny enough to me. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can do it better. <laughs> it says he was very quiet. Though, okay. As well, they could hardly understand him. Well, I picture okay. him a little more, maybe a little like more high pitched, no. a little more nasally, less, okay. less. Sexy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, that was a sexy voice. That was um, a growling, yeah. sexy voice. I walked around. No, you house. don't got to go that hat. No, no, no. Look, chat, chat, chat. chat. No, no, no. Listen, listen. I got it. No, I okay. We got to start it. over. You got to okay. start over. Uh, I was enjoying it. I thought it was a scuff clip. Okay. Uh, go he ahead. said, quote, I walked around to the side of the house, and I looked through the window, and I see two people in that house and one on the couch. End quote. He recognized Walker, but not the second man. He saw Nancy on the couch. He claims that it was here when he saw her naked with a cord from her neck to her feet. He also appears to have seen her alive when he went into the house to help her. He also claims when he entered, Walker punched him in the nose and told him that if he didn't help him dispose of the body, they would kill him. And if he didn't drive the car, they will kill him for that too. Waldrop continued, saying he drove Walker's car while the defendant got behind the wheel of Nancy's gray Plymouth, followed by the second man in a third car. They drove to Tanyard Gap and then returned to Bluff together. The next day, Waldrop says he returned to Walker's house and saw Walker burning papers he thought were letters. I just don't understand why he claims to have went back to his house. Like, why the fuck would you go back to someone's house after something like that happened? The whole story is very strange. Yeah. Right from the back. Or right <laughs> right from the start. Like, yeah, half the stuff he says is stuff that he's never told anyone before. It's not been corroborated by anyone since before or after he's told it. Yeah, and we'll get into it a little later about how it doesn't all line up either. At this point, Joe Huff, wearing his one summer suit that rarely saw daylight anymore. <laughs> how do you know? Because he doesn't wear, it says it in the, like, he just doesn't ever wear suits anymore. And when it says summer suit, is it seersucker? Because I'm really hoping it's seersucker. I think so. Okay. Joe was ready to launch a fear attack. Joe was ready to launch a fierce attack on Johnny Waldrop. He launched into a cross-examination, sometimes so blistering that it has been said to have caused jurors to grimace. Yeah, he laid into this redneck. I'm ready for it. (laughs) He referred to Waldrop simply as Johnny, and Johnny referred to him as Joe or Huff. Huff laid into Johnny from the get-go, asking, quote, Why did you tell Sheriff Roberts that you're not up there and you didn't know anything about what happened? End quote. To which Johnny replied, quote, I wish not to answer that question. End quote. Do you want to say that? Yeah, I'll okay. say <laughs> To which Johnny replied, quote, I wish not to answer that question. End quote. This is how he talked. I know. It's just fun. <laughs> it's, it's very, like, they say throughout the trial, he just mumbled. He was, like, quiet because he knew he was fucking lying. It's like Michael Scott. When Michael Scott. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you remember that episode of The Office when he's trying to enter into negotiations with Daryl? Daryl, so then he just starts to mumble. Yeah. And then Daryl has <laughs> to exactly lean in. That's exactly what That's what Johnny, he just read a book about it and try, was trying to. <laughs> John, like, like Johnny could read. Like he could read. Okay. He asked him why he had not told the sheriff's deputies who had questioned him, anything about Walker's involvement. And if he had ever told this story to the district attorney, Clyde Roberts, to which Johnny shouted, No! (laughs) Sorry. I'm just... No! 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 I didn't! (laughs) No! Huff Huff also brought up Waldrop... Huff also 
brought up Waldrop's gigantic criminal history, trying to establish a motive for him to lie in order to get special treatment from Sheriff Ponder. He brought up the theft from a he brought up the theft of his uncle's truck and a church break-in for which he had been sentenced to five years in prison. Huff asked how he had been able to get that sentence suspended. Waldrop said, quote, I guess E.Y. Ponder could answer that. Unquote. All right, great. Great, Johnny. I mean, <laughs> he's flat out just like, you know what's happening you here. Know. <laughs> you know what's I think, going on. I think we all know what's happening here. Let's just get E.Y. Ponder up on the stand. Okay. And they do, later. A couple days. Huff continued down this path, asking, quote, Who's taking care of you, Johnny? What did they promise if you testified? Why are you walking around here when you've got a five-year sentence you ought to be serving? I say, you didn't tell anybody until you had been down there in jail for about a year and couldn't get out. The assault continued, bringing up things Waldrop had told the defense attorney during earlier courthouse encounters before Walker was charged. According to Huff, Johnny had told him he didn't know anything about Ed Walker that he was not up there. Huff also mentioned that Johnny had told him he was on drugs the entire time he was in jail and didn't know what he was saying. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to say it one more time. Johnny told Huff that he was on drugs his entire time in jail and that he didn't know what he was saying. He's just like, he didn't have, he, it's almost like, I don't even know. He, he planned, he didn't have a plan. He was like, I'm going to go up there and tell him what happened. And then all of a sudden there's a court date and he's like, oh, fuck. I don't, I don't know what to say now. I'm out of ideas. That was literally the end of his that plot. Was my, that was my idea. Lie that was my plan. To get some sort of like help in jail. Huff also had asked, like, uh, apparently Huff had n- somehow found out that Waldrop had just told another witness that they had him hung up on a hook and he could not get out, and they thought he was going to come up here and swear lies on Walker and that he would not go to hell by swearing a lie to send somebody to the pen. So he's just like, he is up there not defending himself against Huff's accusations that he's flat out lying. I'm so to sorry. Everyone. I don't understand what you just said that Waldrop had told a different witness yeah. that he was lying. Yeah, apparently he had, outside of the courthouse, he had told someone else who was also a witness that he had been lying the entire time. And so then Huff brought this to Waldrop, and Waldrop just said, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know. know. That was That's how he responded to that accusation. I don't know. <laughs> Fucking. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, it's unbelievable. This, once again, what is going on? Why are we in a courtroom? Why is Ed Walker here broke? How did it get that far? Yeah, how did it get how did it get that far? How did it get this far? Mhm. Huff's uh. assault didn't stop there. He brought up the fact that Johnny had been confined several times in the state mental hospital to which Johnny shot back, quote, "They found out I wasn't crazy." End quote. He also brought up the fact that Johnny had beaten his cousin with a pipe at one point in time. As the legal beating of Johnny continued, it became apparent his stress levels were through the roof. At one point, after being denied a bathroom break by the judge, Johnny simply got up and left. While they were waiting for Johnny to return, one of the spectators looked out the window and noticed that Johnny had left the courthouse and was walking down the street. (laughs) He just left. He just left. He was over it. He couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> he just walked out the door. He was, that was, once again, a brilliant plan from Johnny Waldrop. I'm just going to leave again. <laughs> that deputy will send me more money. I can go back to Salt Lake. There you go, or L.A. <laughs> Thankfully, he was brought back by deputies, only to threaten Joe Huff when the cross-examination continued, saying, quote, I'm just afraid my nerves will make me choke you to death. <laughs> oh, my God. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. I thought that nobody in Madison County knew how to strangle a person. No, nope. state trooper never even, met Johnny, I guess. They, ne- they didn't even know you could kill somebody that way, right? Nope. <laughs> there he is on the stand saying, <laughs> you better watch out. You might just make me choke you to death. <laughs> oh, my God. The jury was obviously shaken by Johnny's answers and reaction to Joe Huff's questions, and they weren't the only ones. The entire courtroom began to wonder how on earth this trial ever came to be. Tom Maloney, who attended parts of the trial, said Waldrop, quote, was just bouncing off the walls, literally flailing himself around the courtroom, end quote. Harold Bailey, a man who had previously been a court administrator and sheriff's assistant in both Madison and adjoining Buncombe County, said, quote, 
the state's key witness made the poorest witness I have ever seen in all my years in any case, civil or criminal, anywhere <laughs> in any court I've ever been in. He's a criminal. He's a convicted. He's a convicted felon. At one time after the murder, the sheriff wanted to indict him. He's the least credible person I can think of. End quote. <laughs> Oh, That's man. a pretty great quote. <laughs> it is. It's like never in my Just life. Anywhere. Ever. Anytime. Any court. Any case. Anybody. He's, he's, te- he's literally the terrible. The worst. The worst. Even the prosecutor, Tom Rusher, was embarrassed. And years later, claimed he knew the case was over long before it began after hearing Johnny's story. The trial itself did come close to a mistrial when Johnny walked off the sand a second time. This time, he was followed by deputies very quickly. (laughs) Yeah, so they brought him back. So it's probably pretty apparent to everyone. At this point, the prosecution's case was a lame duck. But the trial did continue. FBI agent John Henniger, who had been at the site where the body was found, took the witness stand and eventually revealed that Nancy's clothing and jewelry were now missing, along with the cord that caused her death. This part makes me so angry. Yeah, this is fucked up. Um, SBI agent Charlie Chambers believed all physical evidence from the scene, which the FBI had turned over to state investigators, had most likely disappeared when the Asheville office flooded. Several other people took the stand the second day as well. Dr. Paige Hudson, who performed Nancy's autopsy, gave his results once more. Nancy's former landlady, Glendora Cutshaw, took the stand for the prosecution as well. In a move that we see all too often in rape cases, Joe Huff did his best at this point to undermine Nancy's character. Whether or not that was a tactic that he wanted to use was never brought up. He was able to get her to confirm, however, that she had denied a request from Nancy and Diana Buzzard to allow two men out-of-town visitors to spend the night at their cabin. What a time to be alive. What do you mean? That these two adult women who had moved across the country to volunteer their time in this county had to ask permission from their landlord to have two people stay over. Yes, yeah. they were men. Yes, they were two single women. But what a time. Really? I mean, I mean, just think. It's 1970. This place is, fashionably speaking, 10 to 20 years behind the current times. So that would set them in like the 40s. And in the 40s, everywhere was fucked up. I just don't like it. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, I don't. I, I think get it's it. stupid. I get it. I don't like it. It's ridiculous. Um, Stan McElroy, a local man who had driven Vista workers on several occasions, claimed he had once seen Walker put his hand on Nancy's breast, and later he had seen Walker kiss her. This statement would earn Stan the cold shoulder of a large portion of his community for the rest of his life. He was from Bluff, and Bluff had Bluff supported Ed Walker. Uh, yeah, and it, he talks about for years that no one would talk to him because of what he did, and it's kind of his own fault. Well, it sounds like he took the stand in favor of Johnny Waldrop. He did. Uh, he was on, he, the prosecution drew, brought him up as a witness. Right. I, I'm not sure why he did it. Uh, another woman, Velma Shetley, who had lived not far from Walker's house, testified that late Sunday night, she heard a car that might have been Walker's drive down from the direction of his cabin. She said that she saw headlights flashing, a horn sound, and another car pulling up behind the first. She testified that she told SBI agent Charlie Chambers all of this, but later that week, Johnny Waldrop had informed her that he had witnessed a murder and swore her to secrecy. Fourteen years... Oh, go ahead. What? No, it's just, that just... Uh, that just... That, that little tidbit is interesting to me, considering that Johnny Waldrop lived next to... Or Waldrop lived next door. Yeah. So the car coming from Ed Walker's house could have easily be coming from Waldrop's yeah, house. it could have been. Um... And then I don't understand if she had tested and already testified to the SBI agent and then like later Johnny informed her or whatever. And then she was sworn to secrecy. Where was Charlie Chambers? Why didn't he follow up on it? We'll we'll come to find out that the SBI and FBI did not want anyone but Ed Walker to be accused or like charged with this crime. Yeah. Well, that's why. Yeah. Um, Now, basically, also, eyewitness testimonies are bullshit. Yeah. Eyewitness testimonies are very, very rarely are they accurate, um, especially 14 years later. But anyway, after the 14 years had passed, uh, she was released from her promise, according to her, and she told Sheriff Ponder about what she had Johnny had told her. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, the last witness on the second day, to me, is the most interesting. Walker's roommate, James Waldrop, no relation. Really? No relation. Okay. Um, yeah, there's, it's like that there. I mean, there's a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, my last name is there all over the place. All but, kinds you know, of Shelton's. I don't think we're all related. I hope not. Um, <laughs> I but yeah, so James Waldrop, <laughs> James Waldrop took the stand 
and was asked about a recent visit that had happened to him in his home in Georgia. And this is very interesting and telling to me. E.Y. Ponder and Bill Gillette, who was the same SBI agent who had went to Walker's house in Florida, had arrived at his home in Georgia unannounced. He recalled an almost word-for-word confrontation with the two that Walker had experienced in Florida. James was told that an eyewitness had placed him at the scene of the killing. The sheriff also told James he might be indicted for the crime if he did not cooperate. Huff alleged that when Ponder and the other investigators learned that James Waldrop had a strong alibi, they tipped Johnny to change the identification. Huff wanted to make clear that Sheriff Ponder simply wanted a confession and that he would use Johnny to get it out of anyone. On Wednesday, E.Y. Ponder took the stand, and Huff once again went on the assault. Although he never really got Ponder to crack, at one point he did ask if the sheriff's prosecution of the Nancy Morgan case had been a campaign priority dating back to the 1970 race, and asked did he not intend to solve the case in a pledge during his campaign in 1982. Ponder simply replied, I only agreed to give it my undivided attention. So... Just, like, completely deflected the question. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Strangely enough, behind the scenes, Ponder had told uh, Tom Rusher that he was in possession of what he thought was Nancy Morgan's belt that was broken in two. He also had an Avon fragrance bottle that he said belonged to her. He said it had been recovered by a neighbor from Ed Walker's backyard following the killing. Rusher said that he couldn't put the Avon saleswoman who had given Nancy the perfume on the witness stand due to illness. And that's probably for the best because if she had testified, Ponder would have needed to explain how he got in this evidence because at the time, he was not the sheriff. Rage! Yeah. Sorry, this moment makes me so angry. Yeah. What the fuck? Why does he have her belongings? I really, this leads me to believe that he was way more involved than we than we ever think that he was or ever thought that he had been. Yeah, um, he had little snakes all in the county oh doing stuff Oh my God. Sorry. Sorry, <laughs> okay. everyone. Sorry for our headphone wares. Um, but what the fuck? What I don't know. Fuck? So I guess, but now because this Avon saleswoman didn't take the stand, that like this didn't really get brought into the case at I th- all. I think he did that intentionally. I think he said she was ill. Because, oh, Rusher was like, we're not going to do that. Yeah, because yeah. he knew what that would imply. And then they would have to answer to that question on top of, you know, the others. Oh, my God. Yeah. Ugh. Um. So Huff called Ed Walker to the stand on this day as well. He said he did not kill Nancy and had not been in love with her or had sex with her. He also claimed to be incapable of tying the knots that were around Nancy's feet and neck. He also spent most of his time on the stand rebuffing the testimonies against him from earlier in the day. This is really all that happened to Ed during the trial. It's really funny to me that a trial focused on what he did really became more focused on the fact that the village idiot had convinced local law enforcement that he was telling the truth. Yeah. Um, Ed's life was ruined, and this is really, like, there was nothing eventful about his time on the stand. When the prosecution rested on Wednesday, Huff moved for dismissal of all charges, to which Judge Lewis did in fact drop the rape charge. But for some reason, he ordered the trial to continue. So, what? I guess like... So he just, I mean, I guess... Maybe he just wanted to see what would happen. Like a heinous charge, more heinous than murder. No, he was saying that there was not enough evidence to put Walker uh, in a situation where he could have raped Nancy. Gotcha. But still... uh, Murder? Yeah, still there's a chance he killed her. <laughs> okay. I don't know. All right. Um, Thursday was focused once again on Johnny Waldrop. Uh, <laughs> they basically just spent the whole day destroying his reputation, if it wasn't already bad enough. Uh, Pinsky writes- Well, Lord knows they did that to Ed Walker. Yeah, he did. Uh, he deserved this. Pinsky writes that his own family members, neighbors, cellmates, and acquaintances in one way or another corroborated the defense's contention that Johnny had made up the story to get out of jail. Someone that knew Johnny stated nobody could believe him on a stack of Bibles. And if you can't, you know, a stack of Bibles is a big deal in the South. Even his own mother spoke for the defense, saying that Johnny was a habitual liar and actually came to her and told her that he had told a story to get out of jail on the stolen truck charge. She also said that Johnny would have had to go through her room in order to leave the house the night of the murder, and she did not hear him do so. Um, so, um, did we stay, state earlier that Johnny was Ed Walker's neighbor because he was living with his mother? No. Okay. But, yeah. Now we're he just was. saying it. And would yeah. have had to go through her bedroom to exit the home. 
Yeah. Great. But, okay. you know, looking back on it now, it's like it makes me think that, like, I don't know if he was ever there because of some of the information that we're going to learn later. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um. But that being said, he's also a fucking giant liar. His own mother he's, took the stand yeah, against him. Yeah, he's absolutely full of shit. Um, <laughs> he's just like, Mom, Mama, I, I told a fib. No, you know, well, it was more you know, like, I think he probably said charge. it proudly. I, I think it was more did. like, Mama, I'm going to get out of jail. I came up with this great story, yeah, and I'm coming home. You're probably right. So the condition of Nancy's body at the time of discovery was also discussed, a key point of contention during the trial. If what Johnny's saying was true about Nancy Morgan, she would have had to have been killed no later than early Monday, and she had left Walker's house alive Sunday night, so he couldn't have committed the murder. Huff recalled that Dewey Griffey, a former deputy, told the coroner at the time that Nancy had been dead three to four hours when her body was found Wednesday morning. Photographs also helped the defense, showing Nancy's body at the scene without swelling, discoloration, or decomposition. The deputy had said he smelled no odor. So the photos of the body really destroyed the rest of Johnny Waldrop's story. There's no way it could have happened during that time. Uh, there were a few blips for the defense, however. Nothing serious, but, for example, Richard Hames chose not to testify for Ed Walker. Why is that? He, a lot of people think that, so Jeffrey Hammer, the the local guy. Yeah. Or the, I guess he was the national guy, right? I don't know. So, basically, Richard Hames thought that the person that testified before him painted him in a bad light. And a lot of people, the Breckenridges that lived in Hot Springs included, still put a little bit of the blame on him because he didn't do anything about Nancy living alone in Shelton Laurel. Gotcha. Yeah. So he just didn't, he thought that his testimony wouldn't end up helping Ed. Yeah, I think okay. so, because he he said that he would testify for Ed, um, because the prosecution actually reached out to him, and he was like, there's no way I'm going to talk to you about this. Right. But, uh, yeah, it, I guess at the after he felt like he had been painted in a bad light, he chose not to testify. There was also a story by a prospective witness named Harold Reed. This is a piece of evidence that wasn't actually allowed in court, and it came up later, so they didn't get to use it, which oh. is why I put it under the blips. A man named Harold Reed told, him, uh, told Huff a story he had heard from a local man. The man told Huff he had seen several cars, including the government Plymouth, late Tuesday night where the body was found, and he had recognized some of the cars as belonging to young men from the town of Hot Springs. The testimony would have most likely been hearsay, so Huff declined to use it. Friday was the last day of the trial when closing arguments began. James Baker, part of the prosecution, started and was tasked with trying to convince the jury that Johnny Waldrop was not full of shit. Uh, he criticized Cross. <laughs> All he could do was criticize Huff's cross-examination and claimed that Huff had acted as if, as if Johnny was on trial. After Baker was done, Joe Huff, according to Pinsky, began a long, folksy, sometimes rambling summary of his case. In a classic example of mountain storytelling, the defense attorney launched into a vivid mini-lecture about the signing of the Magna Carta and how it led to the modern jury system. That's like right out of like My Cousin Vinny or something. Yeah. Uh, Huff also chose to use a mildly racist anecdote, which we will not repeat on the show. Uh, once again, a lot of weird crossed wires. Uh, Huff... It's just like, why? Yeah. Just don't. How about, uh, how about not? Uh, Huff continued to paint Ed Walker in a positive light and attacked both the character and the story of Waldrop. He spoke in detail about a big gap in Johnny's story. He had testified that he had acted as an accomplice only because Walker threatened to kill him. Huff reasoned that might have held true while they were together, but why then do you not go some other way when they drove in different cars to leave the body? He, <clears throat> he also brought up the fact that Johnny returned to Ed's house the next day, saying, Do you believe that somebody would threaten me and cause me to take help take somebody's body that I would be up there the next morning palling around with them? That's absolutely absurd. Huff closed with a recital of a verse from the Navy hymn. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, he went all in. Um, so I have it here. Hold on, hold on. It went something like this. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm doth quiet the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us as we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. So interesting quote. Beautiful. Not very relevant. No, but you know it hit. You know people like uh, nice sounds. Um, well, and I'm just sure compared to the ramblings of Waldrop and yeah, Rusher, <laughs> it's like some icing it, it, on the yeah, cake. Yeah, definitely. But Ed Walker claims that uh, his closing argument had him in tears. 
He said it was like he was reciting poetry. See, there you go. Yeah. Now we get to one of my favorite parts of the story. Rusher was last up with closing arguments that day. The first addresses the political dimension that seemed to overshadow the trial. He said that Huff wanted the trial to focus not on Ed, but on the sheriff. And that, quote, he would like you to find Johnny Waldrop guilty. He would like you to find me guilty. He would like for you to even find Nancy Morgan guilty. And somehow, in all of that process, you would forget about your actual duty. And that is to consider the guilt of Ed Walker, end quote. Next, in an act that truly seals the deal on this train wreck of a failed prosecution, Rusher actually said this to the jurors, quote, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm laughing at quote, <laughs> I don't know whether Johnny Waldrop is telling the truth or not. I don't End know quote. why he did that. What are you? What are you doing? He just got just like the words are just like beans now, spilled out of his know. mouth. I don't know whether Johnny Waldrop is telling the truth or not. Do you think it, like he was saying it and his brain was like, God damn it! It was like he was yeah he was <laughs> no. saying it. The words were coming out of his mouth and there was a f- slow fuck. Yeah, like a little fizzle head, like, came out of the top no, of his head. Fuck! Don't do it. It was too late, though. It was too late. The words were already in his mouth. He then encouraged the jury to remember that for 15 years, Walker had been a prime suspect for local law enforcement. He defended Nancy's character and insisted that if jurors did not believe Nancy's death occurred on Sunday night or Monday morning, quote, then by all means, ladies and gentlemen, come in and say we find him not guilty, end quote. Whoa. <laughs> so it's just like I think he gave up. The entire I think he was prosecution up was built on Johnny Waldrop's statement. And I'll never understand why they let it happen. Why did they let it happen? I You're right. Know. I think he did give up. I think he did. I think he Ru- I, I think Rusher at this point was like, This is I don't know what's going on. I gotta here. dip out. <laughs> yeah, it's in the in the story, uh in Pinsky's book he does at some point, like after this, say that he thinks some of the the Republican uh, witnesses were basically lying to him, and that their testimonies were different than the testimonies that they told him before the trial. Oh, I don't know if that has anything to do with what actually happened, because ultimately, fucking, it was, it was up to Johnny Waldrop, and you know, you I don't think you could depend on him for anything. Okay, so like, let's even take out who Johnny Waldrop is, right? Let's just take that out for a second, which is very important to to know who he is when we're talking about him in the story. But yeah. let's just take that out for a moment. This man is still coming in and claiming that Nancy was murdered on Sunday night. <laughs> During the autopsy, her stomach was pumped and it was noted that she had eaten between Sunday night and the Wednesday morning that she was found. Yeah, I don't know. What the? Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. It's so well, outrageous. It was, you know, it just comes down to like it was part of his campaign, Ponder's campaign. He saw, you know, the signs. This yeah. is it. This might be it for me. And he wanted something to cling to, like many politicians do, to say, look what I've done. I'm important still. It was still. political. Yeah, you it was want emotional. Me to be part of this. It was hot. Yeah, it was, it was still, even 14 years later, it was like a big a big giant sore on the county, and it bothered everyone that it hadn't been solved, I think, that you know, knew about it. And he just tried to basically take advantage of some of a poor girl's death. Yeah, I mean, and they built this case on a, Around a crumbling, dipshit. crumbling foundation. They could have just paid someone with a more credibility <laughs> to say that, I, and you know, but it, they they let they let this dipshit. Well, do I it. think Don, Johnny Waldrop had been the fall guy for them and had done tasks like this for yeah. them in the past, and so why not now? Yeah. Anyway, if you didn't kind of see where this was going, here you go. While they waited for the jurors to deliberate, Huff came out of the meeting and shared some news with Walker. He said, quote, The judge said to Rusher, Tom, when I was a young lawyer, one time I disavowed my witness, my primary witness. Rusher had asked him, quote, What happened, judge? To which Lewis replied, My ass was creamed. End quote. (laughs) Even the judge was like, Why'd you do that? Why did you do that? What are you doing? The jury took slightly longer than an hour before returning with the verdict of not guilty. Woo! You Woo! know, ultimately, it's like it. Uh, he got drug into this, but at the end of the day, he was able to come and be like, I fucking told you! Yeah! You, I feel like the whole county was embarrassed <laughs> at this point. Like, Honestly, At least the been. ones that, yeah, to, to have allowed this to happen in their county and let someone be totally taken advantage of and played like this. I feel like if, if I would have been in the county, like they already thought that they had been given like, you know, a bad hand in terms of Nancy's death. But now not only do they have a bad hand, they've brought a man back 
14 years later. Who had built his life. And destroyed a life. Destroyed it. Only to find that, like, it was a giant joke. pile of lies. Just a, it was a joke. It, it, I'm, I'm sure it's shown even more negativity on the county. Walker's friends from Florida and Madison County mobbed him. His wife and daughter burst into tears, embracing him. The day after the verdict, Walker would take his wife and daughter to the Bluff community to thank his old friends. Without their support, he said, the experience would have been totally unbearable. And uh, this is something I didn't put in here. During the 14 years he had been gone, he had actually stayed in touch with the community, and he had been writing letters back and forth with his old friends. And because of that, they knew the type of person the dad was. And if he hadn't have been doing that, I don't know if the outcome would have been the same. But he genuinely was connected to the people in the Bluff community, and they loved him for that. And they came to his defense. The next year, in 1986, E.Y. Ponder would lose the election for sheriff against Diedrich Brown. It seems as if he knew what was coming. The year before, his brother Zeno was indicted again, this time on federal charges that involved using insider knowledge from the State Highway Commission to buy a property where road was, be- where road was to be built. E.Y. Ponder, normally showing his face around the polling stations, was seen moping about the courthouse, seeming to have already predicted his defeat. In the community Spring Creek and Bluff, where Ed had been accepted and loved, he lost by a large majority. In the same year, Democrats lost control of the Madison County Commission and with it control of the jobs that they commanded. Tom Maloney recalled, quote, I didn't understand how the Ponder dynasty could be crumbling around the edges. I think that the acquittal was the single event that really started the slide. Sheriff Ponder at the time was in contention for National Sheriff of the Year, going up against a fellow from Texas. It looked to me that he needed that one case solved and he would have gotten it, end quote. Word for you meddling kids. <laughs> if it weren't for you meddling kids, uh, he would have had Sheriff of the Year. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like he put a lot of energy into this to try and save his ass, and when it didn't work, everything did fall apart for them, at least politically. And thank God Ed Walker met Joe Huff. Yeah, I, what a stroke of luck. Really, really and truly, Joe Huff was ready to go when he I, he was, you know, coming towards the end of his of his law career, but and he won. I think he wanted that one last chance to really stick it to the Ponderos. Yeah, and he got it, man. He did. I, I'm sure he 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 died with a smile on his face, knowing that what he had done to them. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He died. Yeah. Th- these all. I think they're all. Everyone. Maybe Ey is dead. The older I people, anyway. Okay. Well, <laughs> sorry, this next He time. was already like, I, I'm laughing because you were like, oh, that he's dead? And like, they're all dead. Um, I keep forgetting that the 80s was like 40 years ago. Yeah, it's a fucking long time. As if I was a part of them. I wasn't, but it just seems like it was only like 10 or 15 years ago. Right? Remember Pogs? <laughs> no. No, you don't remember Pogs? See? I know of them. I've heard, I had Pogs. <laughs> okay, anyway. Let's wrap this. Let's get, let's finish this. We're keeping that. Johnny Waldrop never returned to jail. The day Diedrich took office, Maloney stated that Waldrop, quote, was seen leaving the bluff community with a pack on his back, his cowboy hat on, and his cowboy boots on. He said he was never coming back to Madison County until Sheriff Ponder got back in office. Unfortunately for Johnny, that would never happen. Yeah, Ponders were gone at this point, basically. Um... So, Ed Walker returned to Florida to rebuild his life. The Morgans sealed the trial off in their minds and tried their best to move on. Johnny escaped his time in prison and left the county for good, something the community of Bluff celebrated thoroughly, I'm sure. By this time, almost two decades had passed since Nancy's murder, and we were left with nothing more than a court trial whose prosecution rested on a clown. It is at this point the story itself ends, but the author of the book, Mark Pinsky, begins an investigation effort of his own. Pinsky could never shake the story of Nancy Morgan. He had covered many murder cases around the Southeast as a freelance writer in the 1970s. He had made his first trip to Madison County in 1978, and for two decades he would visit the county, meeting with people willing to tell him more about the story of Nancy. He also regularly came into contact with Ed Walker, who reluctantly relived his experience with the murderer to Pinsky. Starting in 1996, Pinsky devoted two weeks a year to the investigation, spending time in his base of operations in Hot Springs and reaching out across the county for information. He was able to meet with the 
He was able to meet with most of the big names from our story, including Glendora, Joe Huff, Dr. Paige Hudson, and Zeno Ponder. He writes about these interactions thoroughly in his book, and I highly encourage you to read it, but we simply do not have the time to go through each and every one. We will say that years of effort by Pinsky had people continually guiding him toward the thought that a group of local boys from Hot Springs were the ones involved with the murder. Clyde Roberts, the district attorney at the time of the killing, had this to say to Pinsky, quote, Just say it was the local people, local boys who like to party in a rough manner. Now, I won't name names because I don't know, end quote. But Ugh. he did. <laughs> he knew. He knew. That's gross. I think he had a pretty good idea. He just didn't. That's people. Who just like to I don't party wanna, in a rough I manner? I don't want to implicate anybody. They murdered. They raped and murdered and tortured a woman. But, you know, they just like to party. Clyde did end up sort of pushing him in, in a direction after he gave him a list of names. He's like, I won't name names, but then Pinsky's like, here's some names. And he's like, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. Yeah. But I like how this is now tw- uh, 26 years later. Yeah. 26 long time years has later, passed. the district attorney at the time of the, uh, the district attorney at the time of the murder, mm-hmm. now 26 years later, is talking to Pinsky and confirms. It's a small ass community, things. and it was even smaller back then. I'm sure, I'm sure everyone knew, a lot of people knew who did it. I don't, I'm not going to say everyone, but I think a lot of people did. Probably including him. I don't know. Well, during his interview, Pinsky named Richard Lewis Johnson, the Hot Springs police chief's son and one of E.Y. Ponder's regular informers. Johnson, who had the name of Firebug, was a huge problem in the town. He was suspected of burning down the Hot Springs Hotel and was one of the young men who harassed the Breckenridges during their time in Hot Springs. He is also the man who approached Ed Walker in the Madison County Jail, serving time for poisoning his daughter to death in a strange, macabre effort to win back his estranged wife. This act would put Johnson in prison for the rest of his life. In the book, his own son calls him, quote, the biggest liar in Madison County, end yeah. quote. <laughs> end quote. Once again, another just giant shithead yeah. has appeared on the scene. Many of Pinsky's interviews led him in the direction of Johnson, whom he decided to try and interview. In May 1998, he succeeded in doing so and met Johnson in the prison he was located in outside of Burnsville in Yancey County, North Carolina. Pinsky describes Johnson as a defeated man. By then in his 50s, with more than a dozen years behind bars, he had a, quote, beefy build, hazel eyes, and a close-cropped fringe of white hair, excuse me, a close-cropped fringe of white hair and a scar on his right cheek. Pinsky never told Johnson why he was coming to meet with him, so he could not prepare a story. But when he asked Johnson about Nancy, the words quickly began to fall out of Richard's mouth. We need to stop right here and let you know that what you're about to listen to may be the darkest part of the story, in my opinion. And very likely, to me, it's the truth about what happened to Nancy. Agreed. So just be prepared, guys. Buckle up. It's going to get a little rough here. It gets a little rough. Um, Trigger warnings for those of you um, who... Or, yeah, tr- trigger warning for those of you who are sensitive to um, materials involving sexual assault. Um, it gets a little rough. Uh, okay. Johnson recalled that Sunday afternoon, as Nancy drove from Shelton Laurel to Ed Walker's house, Johnson and his friends had parked their two cars at the French Broad River just outside of Hot Springs. He said, we were sitting on the edge of the bridge drinking beer, and that they recognized Nancy, and they were still there when she drove back early Monday morning. The men followed her in two cars and boxed Nancy in in a wide place on Highway 2570 outside of town, flicking their headlights on and off in a sign of distress until she stopped. She wanted to know what the problem was, Johnson said. One of the men held up a 25 caliber pistol and ordered her to the passenger side. Johnson recalled that she was tied up in the vehicle. The abductors drove the three cars across the state line to Greene County, Tennessee. Nancy tried to pay them to let her go or to try and contact her parents for money. She offered to leave and not return. Johnson stated she was a young, inexperienced lady who was scared as hell, would be the way I would describe it. Maybe she thought she could talk her way out of it. She had enough sense to know she would have gotten hurt faster if she had tried to run. The odds weren't in her favor. Fuck him. Yeah. From here, the story gets even worse. Johnson admitted to Pinsky that he and his friends had abducted and raped women before and gotten away with it. In a second recounting from Johnson later, he would recall that the men panicked when they realized they had picked up a government employee. 
Johnson also said that on Tuesday, Sheriff Ponder had contacted him with a message and that if he and his friends had Nancy, they had better turn her loose. He claims that on Tuesday night, Nancy was still alive and was brought back to Madison County to an area near Hot Springs called Mills Ridge near Tanyard Gap. He would not hold himself responsible for her death, but admitted, quote, She was all to pieces. She was abused in every way possible. She got violent. They were getting rough with her. She was crying, hollering, everything else. End quote. Johnson wouldn't say how Nancy died, but said that but said that at 1.30 on Wednesday morning, they drove her car with the body in it to the spot where it was later found. So this is not the only time he's going to tell us this story. Uh, he also admitted during this first interview with Penske that it was him that burned down the Hot Springs Hotel. He also claimed unprompted that while he and Ed Walker was still, were still in the jail, Sheriff Ponder had asked him to eavesdrop on Ed and his visitors, including the attorney. So this is just getting like all sorts of fucked up. Yeah. It's fucking terrible. This is so dark and twisted. It makes me fucking sad. So EY knew the whole time is what this guy's saying. Basically, yeah. This fucking EY Ponder knew what was going on and leveraged it. Um, Johnson finished the interview saying that Ed Walker did not kill Nancy Morgan and that he wanted to recount the story once more to Ed and to apologize to him for all the grief that had been caused because of this over the years. Uh, there was a second interview. I'm sorry. That's just so interesting to me. That he wants to tell Ed. That he yeah. would word vomit this story to uh, Mark Pinsky, a stranger, um, give incredible detail to what happened to Nancy and his hand in Nancy's death, but then that he would want to apologize to Ed Walker. It is weird. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? What a backwards-ass man thing <laughs> to want, right? Seriously. That's some patriarchal bullshit. Yeah. Uh, there was a second interview between Johnson and Penske that got into some more specifics, including a reference to a two-tone Chevy that had been seen in the bluff area that Sunday night. Johnson also implicated Sheriff E.Y. Ponder heavily at this time. He said, quote, E.Y. Ponder knew without question what happened to Nancy Morgan within hours, not days or weeks. Not for sure, but there's a good chance they may have knowed before she was found. There was a call made from his house from Hot Springs, and he did talk with an SBI man for sure the next day, end quote. He also dropped hints about other facts about the Ponders, including Johnny Waldrop's playing informer, tampering with ballot boxes, and told a story about a break-in at the district attorney's office in Marshall to collect files when the Ponders were under federal investigation for voter fraud. In a series of letters he wrote to Penske, he also admitted that he and his friends raped other women and that at one time they had a set of keys to a local retreat and could go into the rooms late at night and, quote, be with the ladies before they knew anyone was in their room. End quote. Yeah, this oh fucking, God. I didn't realize how woman, fucked up Hot Springs was back then. Springs in that time. Jeez I don't understand Louise. what was going on. It's their fucking brains weren't developed. I don't get it. It's terrifying. Do you like, hear it, the banjo playing? It, and you know that's fucking. I'm it's sorry. sad, but it's sad. It's but fucking like when you get shit like that happening. He had keys to the retreat. Why? He and his friends Why were literally just keys? free to to well, assault women. And we'll find out will. later. He also had keys to one of the old sheriff's barns or his Great. land, Great. His property. Great. Um, so. <laughs> So during this time, Penske had reached out to Ed with the invitation to come speak to Richard Johnson. Weirdly enough, Ed seemed pleased with the information that Johnson had given. And surprisingly to me, he did in fact accept his offer. And on October 5th, 1998, Ed and Penske returned to visit Richard Johnson one last time. Johnson began the interview by turning to Ed Walker and saying, This man had nothing to do with it. He named, once again, each of the other men he said were involved, including his friend Henry Sharp, who was, at the time, still free. I think he's dead now. I don't know. He's a nobody. It doesn't matter. This time, he also told the two that they had actually followed Nancy as she made her way to Ed Walker's house. He said, quote, if she had driven into a dead end, and if it had not been daylight, the abduction would have happened then, end quote. This time, Johnson claims to have pointed the gun at Nancy himself while the other two men drove and made no mention of the trip into Tennessee. He also admitted that he had had keys to the Forest Service gate at Roy Roberts' old farm on Mills Ridge, where he claimed Nancy was not the only lady they took up there. So, Ugh. yeah, this is a fucking terrible story. These, these dudes were so true Roy pieces Roberts of shit. Roy Roberts was the old sheriff, though. Yeah, they're all good old boys, though, right? They don't, they don't know how to strangle anybody. Ugh. No trigger warning, folks. It gets hard again. Johnson told them that Nancy was not bound during the initial sexual attack that he had been part of. 
He also admitted to picking up the cord used to hogtie Nancy in the trash of Hot Springs Elementary School. Shout out to my old school. <laughs> oh. Yeah, what a terrible way to be implicated. Hot Springs, quit throwing out your cord. The next day, everybody panicked when they found her government identification in her handbag. Nancy continued to try and talk her way out of the situation. He said that he and another man left and returned to Mills Ridge three different times that day and then again several times on Tuesday. Walker believed that the Mill Ridge location, Richard's detailed description of the location, and his account of Nancy's treatment there were all very significant. Ed believed that the graphic, detailed accounts explained another factual detail that had, to his best recollection, never been revealed in print accounts of the events in 1970 or 1984, and it was never mentioned, as he recalled, in the trial. He's talking about the abrasions on Nancy's elbows. Now, if you've ever been in North Carolina, any of those old barns, everything there is packed dirt and rock and stuff, so it would explain why she had these scrapes all over her elbows. So Johnson continued, recalling that the men had planned to hold the Vista worker long enough to decide what to do with her and to figure out a way to get rid of her without going to federal prison. Johnson said on Tuesday he'd brought her some chillier soup from the cafe in Hot Springs and that he had visited several more times that day. He said Tuesday night was when he received a call from Sheriff Ponder telling him that if he knew anything about Nancy, he needed to get her where she could be found. He also said, quote, they better find that girl pretty soon because all hell's getting ready to break loose, end quote. Johnson and his friends, however, were too afraid to take her off the mountain. So Ponder didn't have the stronghold on his people that he thought he did, huh? No. Well, he fucking was using shitheads. That's yeah. the problem. He was using total psycho people that had drinking issues. I'm assuming terrible mental health problems and that were taking it out on other people and he was just using them to his advantage and leveraging jail time over their heads. Um, so he's using really filthy people to do a lot of dirty work. Yeah. Uh, Johnson does at some point claim that like he's he helped Ponder do all sorts of break-ins and shit as right, well. Right, right. Uh, there's a lot to this story that we weren't able to get into. Uh, Johnson claimed that Nancy's death had occurred sometime after his second visit on Tuesday and that it was unintentional. He said no one forced her into choking like that, but some dickhead tied her up in a way that could have killed her, so these people were stupid as fuck goddamn hillbillies. So I don't know what the fuck he means by an unintended... Oh, like, no one forced her. her to choke like, her. We just talk, we just she just choked herself. We just tied her ankles to her neck. Fucking Jesus infuriating. Christ. These people, uh, goddamn, they were dumb. Yeah, like you said, we were... <laughs> Holy shit. We were excited to do this story. We're excited to move on from this story. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, been rough. <laughs> so... Eventually, he said, quote, they drove the Plymouth with Nancy's body inside a short distance and abandoned it early Wednesday morning in another part of Tanyard Gap, end quote. He claims that he tried to tell his story to the sheriff several times, but he was always told to stay away from the investigation. He ended his interview saying, there ain't a thing in my life that I'm proud of that I've accomplished. At one time, I could have been anything I wanted to be. I could have followed my father's footsteps. I was EY's right-hand man in that end of the county. I've helped EY fingerprint places I've broken into. Penske asked Johnson if he felt sorry for what he had done and for what had happened to Nancy. Johnson replied, yeah, if my story gets me time, then I deserve it. That's fucking what I think happened to her. Yeah. I, I really and truly believe it. And there's a picture of this man in the book. And it's like, imagine like someone like smushed a board on someone's face flat and then took it and poked him in the middle. So everything bent in. That's what this motherfucker looks like. He looks like a piece of shit. Yeah. He looks like a stupid piece of shit. Yeah. So this is the last time that Pinsky ever speaks to Richard Johnson, as far as I can tell. After these interviews, Ed returned to Florida with a small sense of closure, but Pinsky continued to investigate. He reached out to SBI and FBI agents that were on the case, but none would admit that there was a chance that Johnson and his friends may have been the murderer. To this day, the FBI agents involved refused to name him as a possible suspect. Pinsky was able, however, to finally... After decades, have the DNA samples that were taken of semen found inside Nancy compared to Richard Johnson's DNA, but the DNA did not match. Now, I don't know if that necessarily means anything. You, you know, know, I don't think it does. Uh, there In were, his story, there were multiple men There involved. were multiple men, and it's also been fucking so long. Like almost and 50 DNA years. degrades. I mean, yeah. they, and who knows, you know, what's how it's been taken care of. 
So while this may discredit some of Johnson's story, it should be noted that in 2010, a scandal in the SBI forensic lab in North Carolina occurred that revealed faulty practices and questionable science that dated back decades and led to several resignations of top administrators. So I don't know. North Carolina state law enforcement took a huge fucking hit, like, in terms of, like, how I think of, like, their credibility. Where's the rope? I don't know. Where's the, where's her jewelry? I don't know. The evidence that they had for Nancy is gone. It is no surprise to me that her DNA, the DNA would have been mishandled. I don't think. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so ultimately, this case is still open. What happened to Nancy is still a mystery. And the only stories that we have to explain it are from two terrible people with a propensity for big lies. Johnny Waldrop and Richard Johnson. Johnny Waldrop's idea was rejected in the court of law. And Richard Johnson was never tried or investigated for the murder. I would like to leave the story with a final excerpt from the book that describes Pinsky's own belief of what happened to Nancy. The quote reads, Rejecting the Ed Walker scenario propels me to Richard Johnson's version or some variation of it. I have come to believe that Johnson and his friends, or at least people he knew, hijacked Nancy as she drove past Hot Springs on her way home early that Monday morning. The Vista worker's death was the result of a rape that, like most such assault in the United States began as a crime of opportunity. It was carried out by local thugs, the sort of violent, prone, young men, already petty criminals who can disrupt otherwise decent communities anywhere. Aimless drinkers with too much testosterone and no place to expend it. Nancy Morgan was not kidnapped, raped, and killed because she was liberal or loose, but because she was a vulnerable female. Any other young woman from outside Madison County, an Appalachian trail hiker, or a tourist, could have suffered a similar fate. And that is the conclusion of the murder of Nancy Morgan, folks. Well said, Mark. It is. Um, And once again, guys, all the information from all three of these parts came from his book, Met Her on the Mountain, a 40-year quest to solve the Appalachian cold case murder of Nancy Morgan. Go read this book, guys. It is amazing. And there's so much that we were not able to touch on throughout the series. And there's there's so much more to it. And it's really, really, really great book that he's written. And honestly, it's a, it's a great remembrance of Nancy. I agree. It's a, a really solid read. Um, one of my favorites. Um, and if you're wanting to learn more about this case, this is really the place to go. Yeah, it is. He has done a very thorough job. There's lots of pictures in the back as well as some of the people that he talks about in the book. And, uh, yeah, that's it. I'm Whew, glad it's over. What a doozy. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot more intense than I remember it being. Definitely. Very, very complex story. Very involved. Um, frustrating. Yeah, really frustrating. Very, very frustrating. And I don't. I just didn't realize it the first time, I guess. Cause I, we've well, read thank this book God for times. Mark Pinsky. Yeah. He... he has allowed us to kind of walk away with some sort of conclusion because of how determined he was more determined than really anyone else in this story. Absolutely. Everyone just seemed to like want to like wash their hands of it. Yeah. And, uh, whether or not they had any involvement or not, they, people, people in the County, just seems like a lot of them just wanted to be done with it and right. forget that it ever happened. And he didn't allow that. And unfortunately, you know, while we have this good tidbit of information, we'll, really never know unless somebody nope. on their deathbed decides to make a confession and yeah Should I and find at that unlikely? point it's just like they're all just fucking liars You're right. and it's like who knows literally i mean who knows? several of our characters were called the county's biggest liar so yeah it's like even if someone were to confess at this point who's gonna believe them anyway anywho um we're gonna go a little bit lighter next week that's we're, right yeah we're gonna figure it's, something out fun for it's halloween. time for our halloween special so we're gonna be finding some spooky stories for y'all to read mm-hmm. actually if you have anything that you'd like for us to read um you can reach out to us at the lrh show at gmail.com share your story with us yeah please we'd love to hear about the time you got abducted by aliens or when you saw a vampire uh let us know we want to hear your stories guys show it us the spook Please. Um, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at the underscore LRH underscore pod. And Patreon at the LRH podcast. Yeah, we're still working on getting some stuff up there for you. We've got a lot of merch ideas in the works. But yeah, good. Exclusive go, content yeah, coming your way. Go check out our Patreon. There's not a ton on there right now, but we're going to make it nice and cozy for you. All righty, y'all. I think I need a nap after that Nancy Morgan story. Yeah, seriously. Oh, also, Facebook. Follow us on Facebook at oh, yeah. the LRH pod facebook.com slash the lrh pod that's all of them we're going to get them all one we day. know some of y'all are still doing it facebook yeah. is still a thing i'm it's not all right our Hit podcast is though uh yeah please do 
and <coughs> <Snap>. uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. I don't like Facebook. Um, please, if you're listening on Apple, subscribe. Give us a nice review. That's going to mean the world to us right now. Help us get on the new podcast page. With your help, we're going to get our stories in the ears of people everywhere. And also, if you're listening to us on whatever you're listening to, be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more episodes because we got a lot of good stuff coming. So, thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed this three-part series. Join us next time on The, the Long, Long Road, Road Home. Home. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. See you later. Enjoy fall while it's lasting. It's gone here, Montana. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>